Sometimes in the past, uh, I've asked you to move around. That just messes everybody up. So stay right where you are. Would you stand with me this morning? Let's pray and go to the Lord in prayer and uh, focus on Him this morning. That's why we're here. So let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you for your kindness and your grace and your goodness, Lord, and your love. I pray that you would just pour your presence here today. Lord, have your will and your way. I pray that our songs and our giving and our listening and our speaking and Sharing together everything will be centered around you and glorify you. Even as we sing these songs, help them become our testimony, our prayer, even the conviction uh, about where we are in our lives. And I pray, Father, that you would continue to work in us and through us. And I uh, pray that if there's anyone in our midst today that doesn't know you, that they would make that decision before they leave. None of us know if we'll ever be back. I pray, Father, that you would help us to understand uh, placing our faith in you is of the utmost importance. And uh, when you call, is the time to answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Remain standing, and let's sing this Kirk Talley chorus. He is here.
Amen. Would you be seated, please? This time we have an opportunity to give our tithes and offerings. And I want to ask for ushers if they would come on, come forward. And um, uh, as they're coming, I wanted to let you know that one of our international missionaries will be here in a few weeks. And I'm looking forward to hearing from Ann Nanny, who uh, works in Bangkok, Thailand. And she is an international missionary. So when you give at the Christmas, the, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, it supports her, and she's going to share a lot about what's going on in her world, but i like to share that with you. Every time we give our tithes and offerings, um, it benefits so many people. So, Jack, you lead us in prayer. Thank you again, Lord, for letting us come to your house to worship. Thank you again, Lord, for letting us give back what you've given us. Thank you for everything you do for us. To surgeries and trips and uh, it's just good to see you back this morning. It's good to have you here this morning. Uh, I do want you to please make note of all the things in your bulletin. I'm not going to read it to you. There's a lot of things there, upcoming events, Bible studies, uh, all kind of things going on. Um, please note the homecoming uh, note there at the bottom of the, the first page, homecoming September the 18th. Please read about the details of homecoming uh, there. I appreciate you Prepared for that, invite people. Um, we look forward to that time each year. 
and you'll hear more details later. I do want you to add to the prayer list on the back, if you'll uh, add a couple of names uh, this morning. Uh, there was a request to add uh, Don Streets on the prayer list, Don Streets. Also, Lisa Cooper woke up not feeling well this morning, so add Lisa to the prayer list. And Trey Jordan uh, has been on the list before, and a young man who's in, in desperate need of prayer. So pray for Trey Jordan. Also, Ms. Pat Meeks uh, is having a pacemaker put in this Thursday. So Pat and Dave just getting over COVID and recuperating. Uh, now facing the, uh, the surgery Thursday. And she said it's in and out. It's really quick surgery. I don't know how they do what they do these days. But uh, so pray for Pat this week. It's good to see Laurie back and several others who have had COVID. Uh, Tom told me he had COVID. Sanders said he had something else. But anyway, I'm just kidding. It's good to have all y'all back from being sick. Uh, appreciate you, you being here. Appreciate Leah sharing last week her testimony and uh, being willing to do that. Yeah, James? Deb Roll is also having a pacemaker put in. Okay. Uh, he, he ended this next coming week. I hope the same thing. I'm sorry I didn't tell you. That's okay. Doug Rolls. Okay. Thank you, James. And Rita's been not very well. Rita's uh, been dealing with. Um, Vertigo, I think we can. Vertigo. Uh, so pray for Rita. Um, George, is she feeling any better today? Or is she about the same? Okay. Pray for Rita. Uh, Sue's been dealing with vertigo as well. I think that's something that uh, several of you deal with from time to time. So keep these people in prayer and uh, remember the ones on our list as well. I uh, appreciate Sandy putting your calendar in here for the upcoming month for September, which includes birthdays. Uh, activities and your daily Bible reading uh, as we've been talking about here recently and I will encourage you as there's still this back there on the next steps calendar if you haven't done that you can catch up it's going to be a little monumental at this point because we're three weeks into but you can catch up and the Gideon that spoke the other day gave us uh, their website information and I have used it several times already. It will read the scripture to you. There's a couple of different translations you can choose from. It tells you about the Gideons. It does tell you how to donate to the Gideons and different things. But the app, the application is, is great to use if you want to do that. It's great to just to, to turn it on and go to the scripture that you're reading for the day and just let it roll as you're listening to it. Uh, if you need to do that, um, please do so. Um, I appreciate Sandy putting that in her calendar. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more uh, later on in the service. Y'all doing okay today? Yes. Uh, have you had any troubles this week? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Honestly, that's good. Wife and, troubles. <laughs> you had wife troubles. No, your trouble now is she's close enough to reach you, James. That's your trouble right at the moment. Y'all had any afflictions, any kind of burdens, any, anything like that? Have you had any celebrations this week? Some good things going on? Some, you know, smiles on your faces? Okay, we, we usually have a little bit of both each week. Some weeks are worse than others. Some are better. We're going to talk about that a little later on. But that's, that's our journey. That's part of the journey. It really is. Um, we're going to sing a song that simply says, Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Burdens, like a backpack on your shoulders. Uh, taking that weight off. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. And as we sing this, think about the words as we sing. Okay, let's sing, let's sing together.
<laughs> like, What's coming next? There are some messages that uh, are more excited to preach than others. Some of them are very difficult. Uh, today is not that day, so I am excited to share with you about the news that we're going to talk about today, because just a few weeks ago, the question was asked, how could a loving God allow so much suffering? And we talked about that several times. Today, the title is different. How does a loving God provide? And that's a different aspect of the Christian life, but it's certainly um, part of God's character. I want to read this to you about happiness. You don't know anything about happiness? I hope so. I hope so. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Psalm 103, 1. Everyone has a different idea of happiness. The inspirational speaker and writer Dale Carnegie once said, success is getting what you want. Happiness is wanting what you get. But the Bible teaches that happiness comes from being happy with who God is. Deuteronomy 33, 29 says, Happy are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help. Psalm 144, 15 says, Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Psalm 146, 5 says, Happy is he who has uh, the God of Jacob for his help. We're going to talk about that today. Proverbs 16, 20 says, Whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he whose definition of happiness are you going to follow, Dale's or God's? God has made us with great gifts. He has cleansed us with the blood of Christ, and he wants, us to, he wants to use us. He doesn't want us being unhappy with ourselves, but all true happiness comes not from ourselves, but from him. Those who look to him are radiant. Those who look to him are radiant. All right, so happiness is knowing who God is and, and trusting him and believing in him. Do you trust him this morning? Amen. That was really, really weak. <laughs> Do you trust him? Amen. Right. I hope so, because that's the basis of our faith. That's the basis of a Christian's life. We trust in God no matter what. Does God allow afflictions, troubles, burdens to come our way? Yes. He absolutely does. Okay. Can we still be rejoicing and even happy in those circumstances? Yes. Now, sometimes it's hard to be happy when the world falls apart all around us, but we can still have the joy of the Lord. In our readings, we've been talking about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Esau and Ishmael and all their family and their friends and uh, their, their goings and, and their obedience and their disobedience. We've learned a lot in our daily reading, and I hope that you're really taking the time to read because there's some rich, rich uh, scripture here in Genesis, and it gives us great understanding of God's sovereignty and how much we need Him and depend on Him and, and the things He allows to happen and the things that He doesn't and the things He will say okay with and the things, the things that He won't. But today I want you to understand how God provides and that a loving God always provides. A loving God always provides. This is how we can have affliction but not have the burdens just carrying around because if we're in His hands, and, and I, I shared with Doris just a moment ago up there with children to come, we had a, ch I had a children's moment that I want to share with them, and that's about holding things in God's hands. We're, we're in His hands. The Bible says so. I, I want you to, to, this is not part of the, the sermon this morning, but I want you to hear this passage just as a reminder. In John 10, 27 and 28, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So the insinuation there, the clear, not just insinuation, but the clear statement is that we are in God's hands. You realize that? Amen. We're in His hands. Now sometimes His hands take us places we don't want to go. Sometimes His hands go where it's really hot, it's really cold. Where uh, it's not comfortable, it's really loud. Sometimes where we're very alone. Sometimes we're in the midst of a crowd and we'd rather be very alone. <laughs> but His hand takes us places. But if we'll just remember we're always in His hands, then we can 
relax and rest because we're in his hands. And we're not just out here somewhere figuring it out on our own. I want you to get to the scripture and I want you to go back to Genesis 37. I hope you have something to write with today. If you don't, uh, if you can put it in your phones or scribble it on your hand somehow. Um, if you don't have something to write, that'd be hard to do. But um, maybe you can borrow a pencil or if there's one there in the chair in front of you um, beside the envelope. Because I want you to hear these things and I want you to understand about Joseph. Uh, we talked about Jacob and his name was changed to Israel and he's got all these sons, these 12 sons and Joseph was second to the last and, and something really bad happened to Joseph. I want to go back to where this starts in Genesis 37 verses 1 through 4. Genesis 37, 1 through 4. Now Jacob lived in the land where his father had sojourned in the land of Canaan. Who was his father? Abraham, Isaac. Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so there you go. His father was it. That was Isaac. These are the records of the generations of Jacob. Joseph, when 17 years of age, was pasturing the flock with his brothers while he was still a youth, along with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph uh, brought back a bad report about them to the father. You ever have a brother or sister that said something bad about you to your parents? happens on occasion, don't know how. <clears throat> anyway, yes, that's what he did. And he's 17 years old. And he's going, and he's almost the baby of the family. So all they're, they're older than him, except for Benjamin. Now, um, Israel loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a very colored tunic, and his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. So they, they had a godly reason for doing what they were about to do, right? No. No. They were extremely jealous. It said they hated him. They hated him and, and didn't want to be around him at all. If you jump over to verse 18 through 24, same chapter, verse 18, it says, When they saw Joseph from a distance before he came close to them, they plotted against him to put him to death. This is not a little friendly brotherly rivalry here. They want to get rid of him. Verse 19, and they said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Now then, come and let us kill him, throw him into one of the pits, and we will say, a wild beast devoured him. Then let us see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben here, he heard this and rescued him out of, his, out of their hands and said, let us not take his life. Reuben further said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him, that he might rescue him out of their hands to restore him to his father. So Reuben had a, a plan. He was going to rescue Joseph later. So it came about when Joseph reached his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the very colored tunic that was on him, and they took him and threw him into the pit. Now the pit was empty without any water. It was a well, but it was empty. So they throw him in there. Their plan is to get rid of him. Period. Reuben said, just don't, you know, don't kill him. And Reuben was going to come rescue him, but the rest of them just want to get rid of him. Is there any mention about this was God's will at the time? Is there anything said about the brothers had prayed about this and felt like this is the way God was leading them? No, not a word. They hated it. They were jealous. Dad loves him more than me. We just get rid of him. We'll fix this problem. That's all fleshly. There, there's no spiritual part of this from them, okay? Go over to uh, Genesis 39, 39, verses 1 through 6. Genesis 39, 1 through 6. Before we do that, I want you to write something down. Number one, unpleasant. Unpleasant things happen to those in God's will. Joseph had some unpleasant things happening, yet he was in God's will, and we'll see that later on. And I want you to write that down, if possible. Unpleasant things happen to those in God's will because sometimes we assume if unpleasant things are happening to us, we must be out of God's will. Unpleasant things happen to those in God's will. Uh, Genesis 39, 1 through 6 says this. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites. And who were the Ishmaelites? Where did they come from? Ishmael. Ishmael. Who's Ishmael's brother? Isaac. Isaac, Isaac is Jacob's father, Joseph's grandfather. Okay? So, family, okay? 
Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And the Lord was with Joseph. Watch this, the second verse. And the Lord was with Joseph. So he became a successful uh, man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him. And how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer over his house. And all that he owned, he put in his charge. And it came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge and went uh, with him. There he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Now it sounds like it says God was with Joseph, right? Did God just... Leave him for a while when he got thrown in the cistern and his brothers abandoned him. Was God anywhere around at that point? Yes, he was. He was. Now, I skipped several things here in the previous chapter, 37 and 38. Um, Joseph is about to be thrown into prison. He was sold into slavery. Um, he's about to be thrown into prison. But I, want you to, I wanted you to hear right here in 39 where it says God is with him. He's in Egypt. He's a Jew. He's in Egypt. He has been sold into slavery. Does this sound like the life of a Christian? Would God allow this to happen to a believer? Yes. Now, obviously, the church is not in existence at this point, but believers in God certainly are. And the answer is correct. Yes, he would, and he does. And we're going to find out what's going on and why he would do that. Okay? The second thing I want you to write down is this. The Lord is present in the unpleasant. The first thing was unpleasant things happen to those in God's will. The second thing is the Lord is present in the unpleasant. Just because you and I are going through a deep valley or a struggle or a sickness or a surgery or a family issue or work or whatever, it doesn't mean that God has checked out. He does not check out. He is omnipresent and he is with his children. It says the Lord is present in the unpleasant. Okay. All right. I want you to, to move on just a little bit here to the, the uh, 41st chapter, chapter 41, chapter 41, verses 50 through 57. Okay, now Joseph has been put in power, uh, second in command in Egypt. And I want you to see this in, in chapter 41, verse 50. It says, now before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, uh, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him, and Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. Verse 52, and he named the second Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The word fruitful here means growth. It means growth. God has caused me to flourish, to grow, to be fruitful. Haven't just remained stagnant. God has caused increase, is what the word is, increase in my life. In the land of my affliction. Do you get that? Not in the land of my inheritance or in my father's house or with my family or doing the things that I wanted to do, but God has caused me to increase in the midst of my affliction, in the land of my affliction. That's what Joseph says here. The third thing I want you to write down is God gives increase or growth in affliction. God gives increase or growth in affliction. He uses the affliction. He uses the pain. He uses the suffering to grow us. All right. You with me? Okay. I'm glad two of you are. I hope the rest of you are. I want you to go to chapter 46. We're just... Uh, scooting through this um, 45 45 um, did I just read that no. no chapter 45 verses 1 through 9 listen closely to what happens here uh, verse, uh, chapter 45 verses 1 through 9 there is famine in the land understand this there's famine all over the world at this point Egypt is the hub for food it's the only place for food Chapter 45, that Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. His brothers are standing in front of him asking him for food. 
through a translator. Joseph now looks like, he sounds like an Egyptian. For all practical purposes, he is Egyptian. They don't recognize him. He's in Egyptian guard. guard. Um, he speaks Egyptian. He looks Egyptian. So he's speaking to, to them through an interpreter. And Joseph could not control himself before all those stood, who stood by him. And he cried, have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please come closer to me. And they came closer, and he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Watch this. And now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Don't be grieved because you sold me. God sent me here before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but who? God. But God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. Joseph says, it wasn't you who brought me here. Ultimately, it was God. How could he say that? Whose hands are we in? We're in God's hands. Constantly. Continuously, no matter what. He takes us in places that a lot of times we wouldn't choose to go. But never forget, we are in his hands. The president, the governor, the mayor, whomever is in charge, doesn't take us out of his hands. We are in his hands. He is the ultimate authority. If you and I are going through struggles and trials and tribulations, we are still in his hands. Whether we brought those on ourselves or he... Uh, authored those wherever they came but we're still in his hands God is not absent he is not an absentee father he is very present in our time of need in hell just like the scripture says and we have to remember that and we have to understand because a lot of times when trouble comes our way we kick and scream God get me out of here get me out of here we forget we're in his hands and he's the one that is allowing that to happen or as Joseph says he's the one that caused it you have a young fellow who was sold into slavery. His family disowned him as far as his brothers were concerned. His dad grieved over him for years. How can that be of God? Because there was a bigger picture here. And notice, Joseph doesn't say he sent me here just to save your life. He said he sent me here to make sure that, that there was a remnant. He's talking about the nation of Israel. To save the nation of Israel. Because there was no food in the world, period, for seven years. Joseph was sent there so that he would store up the grain and, and he was put in charge and it says God was with him. He was present with him and his favor was upon Joseph. Not just Joseph, but everybody around Joseph. They were blessed by him being there because God was with him. And he put all the grain in the silos and he, he had this plan that God had given him and he saved up all the grain so that when the famine hit so hard, Egypt had enough food, not just for them, but for other people who were starving to death. And Jacob was one of those men. He sent his sons. He said, you need to go to Egypt and get some grain because we're going to starve. Go get some food so we don't starve is what he said. That's God. He has the bigger picture, folks. And sometimes he will take us down a rough, rocky path. Not just for us. It is for us to a degree because we grow and we flourish in that time. Just like Joseph said, but a lot of times it is for someone else. And sometimes it's for multiple people. He takes us down that path because he knows the bigger picture. He sees it. He orchestrates it. He allows it to happen. Yeah. I want you to go to 46, 1 through 7. Chapter 46, 1 through 7. And please see what, what happens here. So Israel, Jacob, it's his name now. Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba, 
offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here I am. And he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt. I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will close your eyes. Then Jacob arose from, Be from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried their father Jacob and their little ones and their wives and the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry them. And they took their livestock and their property which they had acquired in the land of Canaan and came to Egypt, Jacob, and all his descendants with him, his sons, his grandsons with him, his daughters and his granddaughters, all his descendants he brought with him to Egypt. How did they get to Egypt? Pharaoh sent his, his car. He said, I'll send my limo. Get in the limo. I'll bring you here myself. <laughs> he got, they got in the wagons that Pharaoh provided. That's God. Now, you know the rest of the story. They didn't. You know what happens. They get enslaved at some point because they're too big. And the Egyptians said they're going to take over. So this was enslaved them. God knew that when he brought them there. But they also ignored them for a while and they flourished and multiplied and, and grew larger than the Egyptians. And, and you know what God did it there as, he, as you're about to find out this week as we move on into Exodus. The fourth thing I want you to write down is God uh, made God made uh, He may use I'll put it that way. He may use affliction to be our path to Him. God may use affliction to be our path to Him. What does that mean? It means a lot of times He gets our attention in some way or other that we wouldn't choose. And through that affliction, He brings us to Himself. Preacher Earl can tell you a whole lot about that. And hopefully he'll share a little bit about that at homecoming. Um, God uses the affliction to bring us to Him. What do we do when everything is going the way we want it to go as far as our relationship to God? Sometimes we give Him thanks and praise, but a lot of times we feel like, hey, I, you know, I don't really need God right now. I'm good to go. It's like being well. I don't need medicine. I'm well. Okay, Things are going really well. Hopefully, He finds us giving Him thanks and praise and enjoying what He's given us and those blessings. But a lot of times, folks, the reality is a lot of times we forget God to a degree when everything's going the way we want it. But just as soon as the towers come down or something drastic happens, our whole nation starts to pray. We talk about it on the news. You see people, governors and mayors, praying with the same people that can't pray uh, when they're meeting together with their uh, constituents. So we all pray when things get bad. God uses affliction so many times to bring us to himself, to trust him, to turn to him, to say, I can't do this on my own. I need your strength. And to recognize that He is always our source. Always. Whether we recognize it or not, He is always what we need and He's always the one that will provide exactly what we need. So God may use affliction to be our path to Him. And we see that uh, through what's happened here with Jacob. Jacob moved his whole family into Egypt. Now, now where was Jacob to begin with? Remember, back in chapter 12, Genesis, God met with Abraham and said, I'm going to give you uh, a country. Where was that place? What's it called? Canaan. Canaan, that's right. That's where Jacob was. God said, you go to Egypt. Go to Egypt. I'll provide for you in Egypt. I don't want to leave my home or my job or my family or the things that I'm comfortable with. God says, I will provide for you when you follow me. I will lead you. You follow, I will provide. You with me? So many times we do this, we do this thing that we do with our groceries this day and time. We order it, we have it delivered. And we want the same with God. We want to order what we want with God, but we don't want to go with Him. That's a lot of trouble, Lord. Just bring it to me. And God says, I will provide as you follow. You follow, I will provide. You go to Egypt, I'll provide. I'm at home. I'm in Canaan. I'm in the promise. I'm where I want to be. If you want to eat, if you want to be sustained through this life, if you want sustenance, and if you want me to provide, follow me. Even if I take you to Egypt. Or later on, many hundreds of years in the wilderness. That's God. 
And folks, he can see the big picture, and we have to trust him because we can't. We, we see here and now. God sees the whole picture, and, and we play a part in that, and he wants to work in and through us, and we just have to trust him because we're not going to get it all. We're not going to understand it all. Look at chapter 47 in Genesis, chapter 47, verse 5 and following. It says, uh, verse 5 and following here, it says, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. That's God. You're going to, I'm going to move you out of your home, your comfort level, and I'm going to take away all the things that are your security blanket, but I have better things for you. I have better things for you. Just trust me. In the best of the land, Goshen, if you know any capable men among them, then put them in charge of my livestock. <laughs> then Joseph brought his father, Jacob, and presented him to Pharaoh. And um, Pharaoh said to Jacob, how many years have you lived? So Jacob said to Pharaoh, the years of my sojourning are 130. A few and unpleasant, few and unpleasant have been the years of my life, nor have they attained the years that my fathers lived during the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had ordered. And Joseph provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to the little ones. Would you have fed your brothers? <laughs> the ones that sold you into slavery. You think about that. Joseph welcomed them with open arms. He wept so loud that everybody in the palace heard it. And he's providing for his family. And at some point, Joseph had forgiven him. And I think it's the point that he mentioned there earlier. He said, it wasn't you that brought me here. It was God who sent me in. When we have that way of thinking that it's not this world that's pushing us around to where we are today. It's not the world that's taking things away from us or giving us we're in his hands. And when we realize God is the one taking us and, and providing for us and we're in his hands, then it changes our perspective on life. It changes the way we deal with people and talk to people and, and respond to people. And Joseph came to that understanding. So he provided for his family, even his brothers, even his brothers. Um, I want you to go to uh, one more passage here. Um, hmm. Let me hold on just a second. The last thing I want you to write is this. Our affliction may be a way for God to provide for others. Our affliction may be a way for God to provide for others. Just like he said here with Joseph. Joseph's affliction, him being put there in Egypt, locked up, in prison, forgotten for several years, was a way for God to provide for Joseph's family and later on for the whole nation of Israel. A lot of times we just see our troubles as our troubles, our afflictions. God, why are you making me go through this? We're not going to hear him audibly say because it's for this person and this person and that neighbor and that person. And he's not going to audibly tell us that we have to trust that he has the bigger picture. And when we go through trials and tribulations, there is a good possibility that there's someone else out there that can grow and flourish uh, through those times as they see God working in our lives. As they see God working in our lives. There's a boat, two, two boats down from us right now. It's, it's for sale, by the way. It's uh, about a 50 foot, 46 foot sailboat. It's a beautiful sailboat. A couple came into the marina a couple weeks ago and from the Keys. And I parked the boat. And uh, now they're selling it, buying a trawler, which is a, a motorboat. Uh, they got tired of the sailboat, I guess. But it's, it's huge. So if you're interested, just come on in. But on this boat, at night time, at a certain time at night, these solar lights come on and they look just like torches. And they have them all over the, out, the uh, outside of the boat there near the railing. And they're beautiful. They're beautiful. And we can look out the window at night and um, over to the, toward their boat and you can see those flickering lights that look like lit torches. They're beautiful. They only come on at night. They don't shine during the daytime. You couldn't see them. But you can see them at night. They're beautiful. God knows that light shows up in the night. And we
we are called to be lights into this world. And our source is Jesus, who is the light of the world. He shines in and through us. But folks, it's in the dark places that the light shines the brightest. God takes us to those places. He takes us in and through those places where we're broken and where that light can shine through the brightest and people can see our lives and see Christ in us and say, I don't, I don't understand, but look. Look at that glow. Look how beautiful that light is shining through them. There's something different about them. And that's why I wanted you to write that last thing, that our affliction may be a way for God to provide for others, other people. All right? This reminded me of a passage that it probably reminded you of, uh, Romans 8, 28. You don't know that verse? All right, you're about to. I'm going to back up to verse 26, Romans 8, 26. It says, In the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings deep, too deep for words. And he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes, watch this, all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to become conformed. That word is, is like the potter forming that, that clay conform to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren and whom he predestined these he also called whom he called these he also justified and whom he justified these he also glorified so God causes all things to work together for good to anybody is that what it says? no, no. it doesn't say to anybody it says to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose and those who are willing to be conformed to the image of his son. Conformity. Conformity to his son. It says here, and I'll read it again. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God causes a lot of things to work for good that we would see no good in. There is no way there's any good to come out of this. There can. Because God's at work in the lives of his children. I want you to understand that today. All the afflictions, the burdens, the troubles, the trials, the things that you and I go through as we walk through this life can produce something very godly if we will allow God to do that and follow him and trust him and be obedient. And I do want you to understand that God is in the midst of the unpleasant. He is present in the unpleasant. Remember that. Amen. Joseph gives us clear evidence here that God was present in his unpleasantness. God was there through it all. His brothers didn't have a spiritual reason to send him off. They didn't have a godly reason to sell him off to their, to their family members, to Ishmael's family. It was all flesh for them. It was jealousy and hatred and it was all flesh. But God was using that for good. He used that to bring about food and sustenance for the remnant, for Israel, so they could grow and flourish in Egypt. Okay. Does God still operate that way? Yes. Yes. He is still sovereign. He still will work that way. Willing vessels. Willing vessels. You ever try to put a, a worm on a hook? Not late. Not late. <laughs> Not late. I got you. I got you. I got you. I got you. What'd you say? I didn't say that. I know how to put a worm on Okay, okay. I used to try to fish with blood worms on, uh, at the, in the ocean. Y'all fish with blood worms? That's just yeah. nasty. I don't do that. They'll bite you. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> they look like they're going to bite you. <laughs> a worm won't be still when you're trying to put it on the hook. Probably hurts a little bit. It won't be still. I've shared with you some illustrations in the past about 
pain and so forth. And I told Sonia this week, I, I gave platelets uh, this week. And by the way, there's a shortage of platelets and y'all need to be given. So give platelets. And another, just as a side, when the girl's hooking me up, the lady, everybody's a girl these days because I'm getting so old. But as a lady that hooked me up and, and uh, she was checking the needles and tape and put the tape in both arms. If you get platelets, she is out of one and back in the other. Laura, that's, that's good. <laughs> the lady came over and she looked at the chart on the computer. She said, well, they have you down for, and it was over two hours. She said, uh, I hope that's okay. I said, okay. And I thought a minute, I thought, why would it change? Why would it deviate? And I asked her, why does it fluctuate the time that you have me on this thing? She said, well, they've been trying to, she said, they've been upping your platelets along the way. They've been trying to get three units instead of two. I wish they had told me that. That'd been nice to know. <laughs> but anyway, so I gave three, three, I guess. Who knows? We gave three. I told Sonia the needle wasn't the bad thing. That needle marks in both arms, you know, but uh, that wasn't the bad thing. I had tape here, here, and here on both arms. And the young lady came over to take all this off of me after two and a half hours. And she took her own sweet time pulling that tape off. Oh, I like to come out of the chair. And I couldn't, it was hard to be still. There's other people in the room, so you have to you know, act like it don't hurt, but it did. And she just, and she said, I'm so sorry. And the next day she did the same exact thing, just took her own sweet time. I was trying not to wiggle, trying not to squirm. It hurt. The worst part of giving is that tape next time will shave my arms, so she won't do that. And you're trying to encourage us to be <laughs> I'm just telling you, shave your arms before you go. <laughs> couldn't be still. It was so hard to be still because it hurt. And folks, that's how it is spiritually. When God is doing something in our lives, sometimes it hurts. And it's hard for us to be still because we think God must have missed it somewhere along the line or he's not paying good attention or close attention. God, I'm just, it's hard for me to take this. It's just hard for me to go through this. And that's when we have to have faith, folks, because we're not going to have all the answers. He's not going to give us the detailed printout of what he's doing. This is the most detail he's going to give us right here. We have to trust him. Trust him. Okay? Have faith in what he's doing. You don't have to have the whole picture. We don't. We're not going to. We're not on this side of glory. What we do have to do is to trust him and know that we're in God's hands. And he's present in the unpleasant. That's how a loving God provides. Because in this story, God is not just providing for Joseph, which he did, by the way. Joseph flourished. He had a family. He has children now. And he has the authority of the whole nation of Egypt. It's not just about him. A loving God provides through us for other people. That's the bigger picture of the story. God provided for his whole nation through Joseph. But Joseph had to go to jail. He had to be sold into slavery. He had to go through these really difficult times for God to work in and through him to provide for his nation, his family, his chosen people. And it's the same for us. God wants to work in and through us so he can show himself and be revealed to this world that we live in, folks. So a lot of times our unpleasantness is not just something that is for us. Sometimes it's there to show people who we serve and who we belong to. There's a bigger picture. And let's keep that in mind. We're going to sing a song in closing here. It says Sanctuary. I want to read the words to you if I can. The song is uh, it's a short chorus. And it simply says, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Pure and holy, tried and true. Tried, that part, tried and true. Go through the persecutions. With thanksgiving, thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. There's one, one reason that I struggle over calling this the sanctuary, and I trust me, I get a lot of flack for doing that. But this is the reason why right here, you are the sanctuary. If I call this building the sanctuary, you won't think that you're the sanctuary. And you are. Scripture says that's very clear. 
when we leave this building, you still are in the sanctuary because the Holy Spirit dwells, resides in you, abides in you. John 15. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. It's a prayer. Let's stand. And I hope this becomes your prayer as it is mine. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you for your kindness and your love. Thank you for your discipline. Lord, I thank you for teaching us that you have the, the big picture in mind, that we can't. We're not you. Teach us to trust you. Have faith. Father, help us to understand that you reached other people through us. Why you chose that way, I don't know, but you do. Help us to understand it is others that see you in us, Lord, just like that torch that lights up at night. When we go through the darkness, your light shines the brightest. Help us to understand that and be transformed by the way we think, by the renewing of our mind, so that we think as you think. We see things the way you see things, Lord. I thank you for each person here today. I pray that you would pour out your presence in their life and in their families, Lord. Give them understanding, but more importantly, give them faith. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In Jesus' name.